Have you ever wondered when you get up in the morning that you never doubt that it is the same you who went to sleep in the previous evening? Have you ever found it difficult to remember that it is the same you who eat, pray, get angry, feel compassionate during the day, every day? Most of us live our lives rarely thinking how smoothly our waking, dream, and sleep st state move without ever giving an opportunity for self-doubt, to doubt the first thought, I. I is the first thought which comes to our mind when we wake up in the morning. And I is the first thought to fade away as we drop into a good night's sleep. The age-old philosophical question is, where does this I come from? Or who am I? Neurobiology tells you that you are a bunch of 100 billion neurons and a trillion neuronal connections, and therefore you are a product of your brain. According to psychology, you are your mind shaped by culture, society, your habits, personalities, values, and so on. Well, astronomy will tell you that you were, you are, and you will be nothing more than the starry dust. All these positions have a point of view. But what is your point of view as a person who has a rich inner life? Who are you? Who am I? In spite of the theoretical stances of what you are made of, and where you come from, it's an undeniable fact strengthened every day by our experience that there is a first person, an I, who accumulates, shares, and expresses experiences. And without that inner person, friends, inner life is not possible for you and me. Is this first person, the I we are talking about, is completely a philosophical idea? Well, perhaps not. Today, research in neuroscience tells us that it is not the case. The first person we all have, the I we all have, is a combination of our cultural practices, habits, and attitudes, and all these are represented in the brain, in our brain, as complex maps. And these maps change and modify as we make changes in our personal lives. I'll share, with, I'll share with you two examples to understand this fascinating collaborative space between our biology and psychology. Imagine you are in a movie theater. The show has started, and it is slightly dim. You don't see very well. And you have to soon take a seat. There are seats of various sizes, some small, some big, and some of average size. Within a span of a few seconds, you look at the seats, and intuitively find a seat which can comfortably occupy yourself. Another example from our daily life. Imagine that on your dining table, there are two glasses, one empty and one half filled with water. Without much thinking and calculating, you exactly know how much effort you have to put in to lift the glass filled with, filled with water and how much effort you have to put in to lift the glass which is empty. And sometimes you mistake the empty glass to be filled and you put some more extra effort and immediately you recognize, oh, that much effort was not necessary to lift that glass. All these examples tell us about a very important internal capability we have, an internal sense called as proprioception. Proprioception makes our lives easier by helping with us with our movement, spatial navigation, and balance. And it is because of this, without any conscious effort, we know the location of our limbs and the body as a whole in relation to the different body parts and in relation to objects and people around us. And that is why we walk and run with ease and without hitting people and objects around us. 
while this vital sense is challenged in people with psychiatric and neural disorders, it is present in a heightened degree in performers of martial arts, where the other person's proprioceptive capability is also received as feedback. Let's talk about one more subtle but magical capability we all possess and use in our daily lives. Imagine you are in a tea party. There are people around you, near you, and you interact with people who come to you and position within a specific space. Usually this space is your arm's length space. It is the comfort zone to engage in a conversation. But if you or the other person crosses this comfort zone of the arm's length space, your, immediate, your brain immediately gives the signal, oh, something is wrong, and you become alert and sometimes uncomfortable. You interact with people who come within your peripersonal space, and those who move too much out of that space do not enter the zone for conversation, and they do not generate personal engagement. You won't feel connected with them. You feel detached. But if anyone moves closer to you and beyond that comfort space, you become uncomfortable and you become more alert. Friends, this neurocultural personal space is called as the peripersonal space. It is the space around you. It is the space which is also part of your body sensation. And this space moves with you and it is influenced by your habits and the choices you make. It is a space which is continuously created and modified by your brain, your culture, and your personality. What we understand from these two capabilities is our body has the capacity to intuitively know how much space we require, for instance, to occupy a seat, to maintain a distance that is not too distant, and not too near from the person with whom we interact. Now, how does the body know and operate these physiocultural mechanisms so effortlessly? A strong theory responds that it is because of the topographic maps the brain creates of our body parts and which are continuously updated with the help of feedback received from personal habits and day-to-day -day encounters. The entire body is mapped in the cortex, in the neural cortex, like a homunculus. The cortical homunculus represents the importance of various parts of your body as seen by your brain. Well, let's come back to the original discussion which we started, which is what is our eye and what it is made of. The moment I reflect upon my inner life, I can see that there are certain distinct experiences I can count. And the very first of that experience is the sensation of the body. It is not actually the sensation of the body, but it is my body. And it is experienced through the collective inputs received from the eyes, ears, nose, skin, tongue, and also the sensations that come from thirst, hunger, pain, and the capabilities for movement and spatial navigation. The sense of the body is only the first layer of the eye, which is readily available to us. The second layer is the mind and its myriad colors. What are these colors of the mind? Anchor, love, jealousy, anxiety, sadness, happiness, greed, pride, compassion, fear, peace, desire, and a countless number of emotions and attitudes which help us make judgments and decisions as we live our daily lives. Just as the deep emotions we have, this second layer too is always not too obvious to oneself. This is the reason at times we say that, I didn't know that I had so much love inside me. Or you might say, I didn't know I was jealous of my colleague. Why is that I am unable to be sensitive and know about my inner emotions and the secret recesses of my own mind just as, as clearly as I can know about the touch felt by my skin, or the beautiful fragrances discovered by my nose, or the fascinating visuals by my eyes see? Well, this question takes you to the third layer of the first person, the I, which is conscious awareness. Consciousness is the ability to record and register 
what goes on around us and within us, physically through our body and mentally through our mind. The more aware you are, the more alert you become and benefit from the inner content that comes to you through daily experience. The most important and vital layer of the I, the first person, is consciousness. Consciousness allows us not only to be aware of our experiences, but it also helps us recognize our inner self, the deep me feeling, in an inclusive manner with a witness-like capability. Some of the Indian philosophical texts use the example of a mirror. Consciousness is like a crystal clear mirror, which is free of the dirt and dust of the negativities of our mind and the false judgments we make. If consciousness is not invoked, the day-to-day -day decisions we make or the residues we form in mind tend to build a narrow personhood, a narrow I, an ego that is fragile in the long run of our life. The power of consciousness is to protect the first person by increasing the depth of our inner vision and including more information while we make decisions. And also it gives us the ability to cherish hope, be more imaginative, and also to value nonviolent coexistence. Today in consciousness studies, the central puzzle is how does the many discrete quantitative neural processes combine and bind together to give rise to the unitary, subjective, seamless feeling of the I, which you and I possess. The million dollar question is, how does the brain, which is the product of biology, challenge the self, which is influenced by culture and society we live in, by our personality, attitudes, and values? Or in reverse, how does such a self, which is cultural and psychological, or spiritual in nature, influence the, the brain, which is biological in nature? Thank you very much.